Hi, I'm Gene Schriefer, Ag Educator with the University of Wisconsin-Madison here in southwest Wisconsin, down in the area called the Driftless Region. I'm going to start with the Driftless Region because a lot of you may not be familiar with it. This is the part of the upper Midwest that touches Illinois, Iowa, southeast Minnesota, and a, and a large portion of it here in southwest Wisconsin. This area never got hit by glaciers. All the three major glaciations went around us, so we don't have glacial drift, hence driftless, right? So if you're in central Illinois or uh, uh, Indiana and it's flat and black, this looks uh, quite a bit different than, than, than your landscape. And I'll talk about here and I'll also talk a little bit about, um, you know, planning for those other areas that, that don't deal with as much uh, topographical challenges as we do here. Um, here uh, and why I enjoy it, <laughs> Every farm is unique. Uh, the landscape changes from farm to farm. There's not really that cookie cutter because, you know, just because you've seen one acre, you haven't seen every acre. It makes it really challenging, but challenge sometimes can be interesting and exciting. I, I've done more than 50,000 acres of pasture plans in my previous position working for RCND as a grazing planner. And you know, I've I worked with dairy, I've worked with beef, sheep, goats, llamas, horses, but we also want to look at the resources that are available to them. And NRCS has some really great tools to do that. One of the things I really learned to adapt and use widely was the web soil survey. And on that, we can map out the grazing area. Maybe it's the entire farm, maybe it's a portion of the farm, and I could learn a lot about the soil. And the soil is a resource that's very difficult to change. It's kind of fixed, right? And different soils have different production potentials. They have different capacities to store water, to build organic matter, different soil depths. And because of that, they have different constraints or limitations or different capabilities in how much forage they're going to uh, produce. So we identify the soils, we look at the potential forage capacity, uh, some of the data is available uh, through NRCS, through the Web Soil Survey, others we have to do with local information. If we've got similar farms with a similar soil, what type of forage yields are they doing, are they, they achieving, and we can incorporate that into our pasture planning uh, process. Now here, again, because of topographical changes, we could have extreme variation uh, in this part of, of Wisconsin and, and most of the Driftless area. You may not see this in other parts of Indiana uh, or, or, or Illinois, but on a hillside to, to my left here, we've got a very poor soil. It's, it's a north field sandy silt loam, uh, very excessively drained. It's very shallow. In a good year, I probably get a ton of grass off of that. On either side of it, on the ridge top, uh, is a new glarus silt loam, uh, moderately deep, uh, moderately well drained, getting three and a half to four tons. And on the bottom uh, of that that slope is is a floodplain, uh, and of course it's a floodplain, right? It's got all the soil, all the fertility, all the moisture we could ever want. You know, we're getting five and six tons of grass off of that. So how do you manage those different zones? And by Looking at our soils, if there's a large enough area, there, there may be a good reason to exclude uh, or, or fence separately based on soil type. Now, if it's a small little area, you're just gonna take what you can get off of it. If it's a larger area, uh, it might be worthwhile considering fencing off or fencing in uh, some of those pastures based on soil productivity. You know, if we fenced in our really poorly, uh, uh, excessively well-drained, shallow, low productivity soil right with that, that bottom, two things would happen, right? We'd either graze the bottom when it was re regrown and recovered, but that shallow hillside certainly would not have been uh, recovered and we're going to overgraze it. Or if we wait for that, that hillside to recover, uh, our bottom pasture with all that fertility uh, is going to be blown up. It's going to be mature. It's not going to have any nutrition to it. Sometimes we need to manage different parts of the farm differently. And when we do that, we have the flexibility to maybe graze a floodplain soil every 21 or 28 days. If we've got a really droughty, low productivity soil, we might only graze that once or twice a season. We've got that flexibility because 
we've managed each of those separately. So we, I've identified our soils, uh, soil productivity. Our next step is identifying where's the potential water. Is there is there available water in this grazing area, uh, and what's the what's the location of that water relative to the uh, grazing area? And if we uh, force livestock here in the Midwest, it's it's warm, it's humid, to travel more than 800 feet. Uh, we wind up creating a situation where the livestock want to hang out closer to the water and they're less likely to return beyond that 800 foot level uh, to go back out and graze. So what we create is a situation where we've got overgrazing close to the water, undergrazing far away from the water, and over time, the migration of nutrients moving towards that water source. So as much as we can, we want to try and get water close to those grazing areas. And, and there's a variety of ways that we can do that. And NRCS has a lot of calculators in, as far as estimating how much water is required uh, for your grazing animals and what the pump capacity and lift capacities are uh, to get water moved to where we wanna, wanna have that. In some cases, we might think about hauling water. That's not really a favorite one for mine. It just takes a lot of time, especially if we're starting to grow the flock or the herd. Uh, it does work, um, but, but, but uh, you know, uh, let, let's look at uh, water where we can get it to on a, on a regular basis. And we've done systems where we've harvested spring water uh, into a, a tank and, and, and distributed that across the grazing area. It's really uh, a, a lot of creativity, a lot of farmer ingenuity in how they think they can get water out to, to where we want to be. What I don't want to do uh, is is always bring livestock into a water resource, especially if it's a stream. Now, we use streams a little bit, and the cattle will have access to that, but we control the access. So they're only grazing a, 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 a bottomland pasture for three or four days at a time. We're not denuding the slopes of that stream. We're providing a graveled entry path so that they're using that, not creating paths down to it. So we're trying to protect the resources as, as best we can. Now, I, I, I'm, I'm not an advocate for fencing livestock off of a stream. I still think we need to raise that or be able to graze those, those stream corridors because as soon as we remove livestock from that stream corridor, it tends to want to grow up in trees and brush. And you know, our goal uh, from a, a fish habitat standpoint is we want a narrow stream and a deep stream. And that's where we have cooler water temperatures and that's actually supporting the fishery. So grazing, managed grazing, and good stream management actually supports fish. So another win-win where we can have some really positive impacts on, on our local ecology. So we, 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 we've identified some areas that, uh, especially around waterways, where we might want to control access. We've got some critical areas that we've identified. And then we need to start thinking about how and where we're going to lay out those paddocks. And, and this is where maybe some of these variations uh, are going to come in and be different between where I am in the southwest part of Wisconsin versus Illinois, Indiana, and some of you flat and black uh, areas of, 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 of the Midwest. You know, we have livestock year-round. Uh, we have cows and ewes, and uh, we do need some level of feed for winter. So uh, we graze our crop ground, but we also harvest some of our crop ground for, for hay. And we don't want to put up a fence that's going to interfere with the haying operation, right? So here, uh, we've laid out the farm that our, our permanent fences are following on a contour. We have a lot of contour strips, so we're going across the slope. And then when it's time to make hay, there's nothing running up and down the slope, so we can you know, run seven and a half miles an hour with a disc barn and, and harvest that pretty efficiently. If we were only grazing, we really wouldn't care so much about the layout. You know, we, we might be mowing it, but the mower isn't a disc bind. Then the size and the shape, or at least the shape, may not be as, as, as big a deal. And in, in that case, I'd say, you know, if we can lay it out square or not, uh, that might be a, a good, good method to think about. What we do with ours, with long horizontals running across the slope, we strip graze that. So we take a permanent wire top and bottom, and then that vertical wire running up and down the slope is a poly wire, something that's fast to put up, fast to take down, and fast to move. And in doing so, uh, whether we've got uh, ewes and lambs, we've got cows, or maybe we've got some stalkers out there grazing, 
you know, I can make that as, as wide uh, as I'd like. If I'd like to move them every 12 days, we make it a little bit narrower. If I'd like to move them every day, we make it a little bit wider. If I need to be gone for a weekend, I can give them two or three days worth of grass by using that poly wire. So, you know, every system's got some pluses and minuses. A permanently fenced paddock system takes the least amount of labor. We go out, we open a gate, we let the livestock in. Uh, very low labor cost in doing it. Upfront capital cost is very high. Labor cost is, is very low, but it's a little bit inflexible if we are, maybe we've got a variable herd size or variable flock size. Maybe we're still growing uh, our herd or our flock. So we're going to need larger and larger paddocks as we go. If we have a couple uh, permanent fences and then we can make flexible fences with our poly wire system, that's what we get. We get a lot of flexibility to that system. If the herd's growing, we can make that paddock bigger next time because all we do is move that poly wire a little bit further down uh, those two permanent wires and, and create our smaller subdivision. And we can kind of strip graze across that. If we've been moving every day, but we've got a wedding, we've got a graduation, we've got a, something we need to be away uh, for a period of time, uh, we just give them a larger area and allow them to uh, have more grass. We know about how much grass is out there. We know what our demand is. We made all those calculations earlier and, and we can do that. You know, we may not want to do it all the time, but you know, we, we shouldn't have to be married to the farm that we have to be there every day. We, we've got a lot of flexibility and that's what that poly wire system does for us.